This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. Cancer remains the second leading cause of death in the world, and the numbers are unfortunately on the rise. To respond to the growing need for therapeutic solutions, much research is needed. In this episode of the Oncogene Brief, I'm talking with Suzanne Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. She is also a board-certified hematologist and oncologist, and a master clinician with passion for innovation in cancer treatment. In this episode of the Oncogene Brief, we talk about how Servier has made oncology one of its foremost priorities and endeavors to become a major player in the treatments for cancer that are difficult to treat and for which therapeutic needs are generally not yet met, such as gastrointestinal, hematologic, pancreatic, and pediatric cancers. In her current role as Vice President of Clinical Development at Servier Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Pandia is overseeing hematology and oncology clinical development programs. As part of this role, she is involved in developing novel therapeutics in rare oncology indications and is leading teams with design, planning and execution of Phase 1 and Phase 3 global pivotal studies. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Youngest in Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncazine at Oncazine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. For information on how to support this program, visit our website at Oncozine.com. That is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E dot com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. This is the Oncazine Brief. For the latest news about cancer and cancer treatment, visit our online journal, Oncazine, at www.oncazine.com. On the phone is Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President, Clinical Development, and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. She is also a board-certified hematologist-oncologist and a master clinician with passion for innovation in cancer treatment. Dr. Pandia, welcome to the Oncazine Brief. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Now, before we're going to talk about new developments of novel therapeutics in oncology and hematology, let me start with asking you, how are you and your teams dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, the new Omicron variant, and the possibility to go back to the office when the pandemic finally fades away? Are we able to see the complete end of COVID-19 and get back to what we would consider normal? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure if we're completely out of it, but I will say we're learning to cope with it. You know, we've had the benefit of working for an organization that's been very supportive of our work environment and enabling us to have degrees of flexibility. So I, I would say that, you know, being part of a global organization, you do rely a lot on having remote capacity to engage with your colleagues overseas. And now, given the pandemic circumstances, we've obviously had to do the same with even our colleagues within the Boston vicinity. Um, surprisingly, we've been doing fine. You know, I think we've gotten used to engaging with our team members um, through a screen. I don't think it's a complete substitute for in-person engagement. So as many of us are getting vaccinated and having access to on-site facilities, we are making efforts to try and meet in person whenever possible for you know team meetings or even for social interactions. So I would say we're coping well and, um, you know, we're looking forward to even more, you know, movement in the right direction. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely been a roller coaster experience. But even with the new variants being discovered, it is good news to see that the majority of people in this country are vaccinated and probably a lot of your co-workers as well. So hopefully things are indeed moving in the right direction. Now, you're a board certified hematologist oncologist. What made you decide to become an oncologist hematologist in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm a hematologist oncologist. I completed my training in both um, specialty areas and 
I am the daughter of uh, two physicians, so I had the benefit of seeing what the lives of doctors look like from a child's perspective over time. And I, I think as I grew up, I became more and more inspired, inspired by the profession. My first glimpse into hematology oncology came from actually shadowing a physician when I was in college. I had returned to my hometown in Florida and, you know, had the opportunity to spend some time in her office um, attending patient visits with her. She was very intelligent and motivated. And what I understood about her is that she was really taking the time to forge strong and close relationships with her patients. I could tell there was a sacred trust, if you will, between them and a purposeful mission to face a formidable illness. And that partnership was very moving to observe at an early stage in my career. And I could see myself wanting to be there for my patients in the same way. Well, at first I would say it's intimidating to be confronted by the idea of taking care of patients with cancer just simply because the subject matter is so challenging itself and it certainly can generate feelings of vulnerability. I, I was extremely motivated by the challenge to unravel the mysteries of the disease and its many forms and, and with the all the advent of the research opportunities that have come about over the past two to three decades, I think we've really made some significant strides in, in the various forms of cancer. And these collective research efforts have yielded very meaningful improvements in you know, new drug therapeutic options for patients outside of the standard chemotherapies. So for that reason as well, it, it's just become a very fulfilling career path, and I'm grateful to have had the experiences I've had. Right. Now, I can totally imagine that and see how it is really fulfilling to see how you can help patients. In addition to being a board-certified oncologist and hematologist, you're working for a company that is focusing on the development of new therapies in oncology. And this is being a big part of what you're doing, right? Tell me a little bit about the company and the focus and the direction. Sure, sure. Well, I can start by saying that Survey Pharmaceuticals is the U.S. subsidiary of the larger Survey Group. And in the recent years, Survey Pharmaceuticals has become a growing leader in oncology um, with this commitment to finding solutions for patients with high unmet need uh, cancers. And, and many of the areas of focus um, that I'll be alluding to separately really, really drive home our intent to help patients with cancers where a lot of other companies have not necessarily made the same types of investments to, to yield the same type of progress. So the focus areas for survey pharmaceuticals is specifically in immuno-oncology, apoptosis, which is cell death, and metabolic oncology, which is the area of focus for my group. Our oncology portfolio consists of many innovative medicines and is designed to bring more life-saving treatments to a greater number of patients across a spectrum of different diseases. Currently, we have four medicines approved in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, otherwise known as ALL, acute myelogenous leukemia, AML, and cholangiocarcinoma. For ALL, we have our asparaginase products, asparlis and Oncospar. And for AML, we have ilocidinib, which are our mutant IDH1 selective inhibitor, and enosidinib, which is a mutant IDH2 selective inhibitor. And as you're aware, most recently, ivocidinib was also approved for patients with IDH1 mutated cholangiocarcinoma. Now we've shown across a variety of different malignancies the value of targeting tumor metabolism and yielding meaningful progress for patients, which is exceptionally exciting. Um, we are a privately held company, so that certainly gives us various degrees of freedom to do what many of our publicly traded biopharmaceutical peers can't do. Um, which I think is also a, a unique aspect of being a part of uh, Survey Pharmaceuticals. And additionally, Survey has significantly accelerated its investment in the development of cancer therapeutics. Um, so not just the, the agents that I had mentioned previously, but also in our earlier pipeline assets and through our discovery efforts, such that more than 50% of research and development is now dedicated to oncology. Now, when you look at the company's website, I see that there is a lot of collaboration with research organizations, academic institutions, all focusing on targeted and small molecule therapeutics. Tell me a little bit about the strategy of collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. So we know that, you know, in oncology drug development, you can't really live in silos. You know, so much of what we do stems from innovative work that's happening through academic teaching hospitals or through other uh, robust oncology efforts through, you know, potential partners um, that we continue to seek. So we do believe in co-creation. We think it's fundamental to driving innovation and therefore a separate part of our effort, mostly through 
our alliance organization and business development, we're able to continue to seek out um, willing and capable partners um, to help us move uh, progress forward for patients. If you're just joining us, in this episode of the Oncogene Brief, I'm talking with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. We're talking about how Servier has made oncology one of its foremost priorities and endeavors to become a major player in treatments for cancers that are difficult to treat and for which therapeutic needs are generally not yet met, such as gastrointestinal, hematologic, pancreatic, and pediatric cancers. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting-edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. Hi, I'm Paul Schmidt, one of the many voices of the Oncozine Brief. Help us by making your message heard in our program and online in Oncozine at www.oncozine.com. To request a media kit and learn more about advertising, sponsorship, and media partnership opportunities, download our media kit at www.oncozine.com slash media kit. This is the Oncozine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. This is the Oncosim Brief. If you're just joining us in today's episode of the Oncosim Brief, I'm talking with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is a Vice President, Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. Now, you already mentioned some of the treatment options that you're focusing on, and one of them is in cholangiocarcinoma. Now, please tell me what is this disease and why is it so difficult to treat? Cholangiocarcinoma is a cancer involving the bile ducts that arise within the liver and then leave from the liver and end in the duodenum, which is the earlier part of the small intestine. The bile ducts are designed to create bile, and to, and which is basically a substance that helps us digest various food products, and, and primarily fat. And as these bile ducts originate in the liver, oftentimes when cancer develops, it can be you know, very um, hard to detect. In fact, patients may at the beginning not even have symptoms. And cholangiocarcinoma, therefore, is not really a tumor that we can easily screen for, unlike breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Unfortunately, by the time the cancer is detected, most patients have already developed symptoms, and that means oftentimes the disease has spread outside of the liver. The way that cholangiocarcinoma historically had been treated was very similar to the way we treated pancreatic cancer because they are anatomically very closely linked to one another. And that consisted primarily of chemotherapy regimens to help control the disease and hopefully prolong patients' lives because most of the patients, unfortunately, are uh, diagnosed at a time when the disease cannot be cured. What we've learned, though, over the past decade or so is that the way that these cholangiocarcinomas develop within the liver and sometimes even outside of the liver is that there are a variety of molecular aberrations that can be detected through genetic sequencing panels. And this basically highlights that the biology of the disease is quite diverse and unique, but also lends itself to targeted therapeutic approaches. And that's where we've uncovered IDH1 mutations are actually uh, present in up to 20% of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, so the, the type that arises within the liver. So putting this into perspective, approximately 8,000 patients in the United States are diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma, and about 20% of those patients will have an IDH1 mutation. So what that means is that by early detection through the form of molecular genetic testing, which can be easily performed on tissue samples at the time of diagnosis, we're able to now come up with treatment plans that do not necessarily involve chemotherapy as the standard only option for patients. Now we have a variety of options where we can start to sequence different therapeutic options. So in this case, patients may start with chemotherapy, and if their cancer progresses or doesn't respond well to the chemotherapy, they would then have the option to try ivocidinib, otherwise known as Dipsobo, which is an oral selective molecule that targets the IDH1 mutation. So this is really a step in the right direction towards precision medicine for a disease that is otherwise very difficult to treat because, unfortunately, once it's diagnosed, it's already spread. 
And it's also a disease that comes with a very poor prognosis in that the five-year survival rates for this population who have metastatic disease, unfortunately, is less than 1%. So this is definitely one of the high unmet need areas that Survey wanted to invest in. I'm very proud to have been a part of this pivotal effort. In addition to a poor prognosis, cholangiocarcinoma is also a rare cancer in many parts of the world. And patients are usually presenting at late stages of the disease with symptoms that are nonspecific, making it difficult to diagnose and treat. Is that right? That is correct. And a lot of that is by virtue of where the tumor arises, which is oftentimes in the liver. And so as this disease evolves, unfortunately, patients may not have symptoms right away um, until the tumor has grown and become um, very difficult to manage surgically. Um, so that's where it becomes challenging. Patients basically present with symptoms, and that's how the diagnosis is made. Right, and obviously when a diagnosis can be made earlier, this will directly benefit patients, making it more treatable as a disease. Are scientists trying to develop new diagnostic options to help diagnose the disease earlier? And what are some of the results? Yeah, to date there has not been a universal screening program to be able to screen patients for cholangiocarcinoma. There are some diseases that can be linked to cholangiocarcinoma, and some of these diseases can arise in late adolescence and early adulthood, and they are basically lesions that um, can lead to inflammation within the biliary tree. Primary sclerosis and cholangitis is one of them. Biliary cirrhosis is another. But these are rarely co-occurring with IDH1 mutated cholangiocarcinoma. So the vast majority of patients, unfortunately, won't be getting screened for the disease for early detection measures. However, it is important once the diagnosis is made to do genetic sequencing of the tumor to identify whether or not the disease harbors an IDH1 mutation, because then you can more adequately describe to the patient what their treatment options can be and then plan accordingly rather than discovering this when it's too late. So in short, the basic message, and I guess that is true for the majority of cancers, is that if you don't feel well, you should make sure to visit a doctor. Is that part of the message that you'd like to share? Yes, that's always the message, I think, for cancers that unfortunately don't have a screening program associated with them. It is true. You know, if you have symptoms that are not easily explained um, or that go away quickly, you know, within a few weeks or so, it's always important to go back to your physician and explore different ways of um, finding out what's going on. Now, one of the other therapeutic areas that you're focusing on is in acute myeloid leukemia. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing in this area. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, acute myeloid leukemia was our flagship program. It was the first approval for ivacidinib in 2018 for patients with relapsed refractory AML. Acute myeloid leukemia is also a difficult disease to treat. What makes this disease so difficult to treat in the first place? Yeah, so uh, acute myeloid leukemia is a cancer that arises in the bone marrow, which is the warehouse of where our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and our platelets are made. And when acute myeloid leukemia develops, um, it quickly takes over the bone marrow's uh, capacity to create healthy cells. And the abnormal cell population is termed as blasts, and these uh, leukemic blasts basically um, take over the bone marrow and can lead to multiple um, symptoms for the patient, which can be include, which can include bone marrow uh, disturbances with relation to the immune function of the neutrophils. Patients can also develop bleeding consequences because their platelet count can go low, and patients can become profoundly anemic because their hemoglobin, um, which is responsible for oxygen um, transport, can also go low, and that arises in the red blood cells. So when the normal healthy cellular population diminishes and the leukemic blasts take over, patients are really put in a imminently life-threatening situation that requires emergent intervention. So leukemia is one of those rare cancer scenarios where patients could die within hours, if not days, of being diagnosed. So it is an urgent situation for patients when they are diagnosed to seek evaluation by you know, a dedicated center that is uh, capable of managing uh, the disease. The way the disease is oftentimes treated includes chemotherapy regimens, and the way that patients are determined to to be eligible for chemotherapy has a lot to do with not only the type of leukemia they have, but other prognostic factors, including age and or other health consequences associated with um, 
with that they may be suffering from. Acute leukemia is a disease of the elderly, so oftentimes patients are in their 70s when they're diagnosed, so they may have a variety of other comorbid conditions known as you know, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, all of that, and that can really limit a patient's tolerance to chemotherapy. The only way to cure the disease is through um, a procedure known as a stem cell transplant, um, which basically means um, a patient is getting a bone marrow transplant from a donor and hoping that it engrafts onto their bone marrow to basically repopulate uh, the healthy cell population and, to, and, and help cure the disease. Only about, you know, I would say about 40 to 50% of patients are transplant eligible, which means that they might be able to go on to get a transplant, but that leaves a significant proportion of patients who unfortunately will not be candidates for transplant and therefore have to receive various forms of chemotherapy to control their disease. Similar to what I mentioned about cholangiocarcinoma, IVH mutations have also been uncovered in this disease to drive the malignant uh, tumor cell. And, and the way that we now apply IVH inhibitors is not only through monotherapy approach, but we're also investigating uh, the ability to combine IVH inhibitors with chemotherapy. And more recently, we've shown that the combination of ivocidinib with chemotherapy, um, and in this case, azacitidine, which is a hypomethylating agent, in a large phase three randomized trial shows superiority over chemotherapy alone. Uh, the study just read out about a month ago and we're very excited to show that now IDH inhibitors also work in combination with chemotherapy to help improve um, the therapeutic signal we already observed with the monotherapy. So it, it's a great advancement and it, it certainly is helping us um, expand opportunities, um, not only within the AML population, but hopefully in other disease settings where we can um, pursue rational combination approaches. And that is the vision that you have with ifosidinib? Yeah, yeah. So we, we actually have two products um, that are also within the metabolic oncology um, umbrella, if you will. And these two are asparaginase products, um, Asparlis and Oncospar. And they continue to widely be used as treatments for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Oncospar has actually been used for over 40 years to treat ALL and, and contributes to improved overall survival outcomes in ALL patients. It's actually an integral component of ALL treatment, which is usually a multi-systemic chemotherapy regimen and has improved survival rates in children. And it's risen up to about 91% survival, which is really, really compelling um, for patients aged 15 to 19 years. Um, we've also seen uh, Sparless uh, show some signals of activity in older adult patients. And so we're actually exploring a label expansion opportunity in the United States right now through a um, ongoing study that's enrolling older adult subjects. So hopefully we'll be able to recapitulate what we've observed in the pediatric and young adult population um, in the older adult population as well. Let's take a short break and then we're back with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President, Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. Sarcoma. Odds are you've never heard that word before. For the 40 people diagnosed with sarcoma every day, it is a life-changing word because sarcoma is cancer. Through awareness, advocacy, and research, the Sarcoma Foundation of America is bringing hope to the families whose lives have been turned upside down by a cancer they had never heard of until diagnosis. Please join us in the fight to find the cure for sarcoma. For more information on the work of the Sarcoma Foundation of America, go to curesarcoma.org. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. In today's episode of the Oncosin Brief, I'm talking with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President, Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. In this episode of the Oncosin Brief, we talk about how Servier has made oncology one of its foremost priorities and how the company endeavors to become a major player in treatments for cancers that are difficult to treat and for which therapeutic needs are generally not yet met. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Now, those two products that you've just mentioned are very similar, right? 
I think the biggest difference is that one of the drugs is pagulated. Tell me a little bit more about those two agents. Yeah, it's a good question. So they are very closely linked to one another. And actually, Asparlis and Ongifar are both pegylated versions. Asparlis, uh, the linker component to the pegylated protein is, is what really distinguishes Asparlis from Ongifar. And it basically creates a longer half-life for the, uh, for the, for the drug itself, and it, it requires less frequent dosing. So Ongifar is given on a biweekly schedule. Asparlis can be given every three weeks. And so that's important because it hopefully can limit the numbers of times patients have to come in for their infusions. Um, it also um, has a longer shelf life as well so for the ease of administration. Aside from that, the safety profiles are quite similar, so I wouldn't say that there are major distinctions there to be made. Um, but yes, uh, they, are, they are very closely linked. And the difference is in the patients, right? Correct. Yeah. So right now, you know, we are expanding this far less program specifically in older adult patients. So we'll have a m much more broader application for patients with ALL. Now, one of the things that I noticed is that Servier is really a research focused organization, which has significantly accelerated its investment in hard to treat cancers with more than 50% of research and development dedicated to trying to find treatment options in areas of high unmet medical need that may be truly move the needle for patients. Tell me a little bit more about this. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, we have three main areas um, of focus, and that includes, you know, both early stage development programs, so first in human studies, as well as pivotal late stage programs, so programs where we are running large randomized controlled studies to enable registration paths. I will say whenever you're in oncology drug development, you really do want to seek out early signal detection for anything that looks compelling or promising with respect to response rates for patients or meaningful improvement in time to event endpoints like progression through survival or overall survival. So while we have early and late stage development programs, we are continuously paying attention to the data and understanding ways in which we can have very um, select approaches for targeting the right patient population. And that's absolutely essential for cancer drug development is to really be able to know where the biology of the disease fits in with the specific patient population so that you can be uh, very nimble and efficient in the drug uh, development process. Because a lot of these indications are considered novel, or excuse me, orphan um, indications, we do have ability to you know, talk to FDA, talk with other regulatory agencies about efficient paths towards uh, drug development in these settings. So this could include fast track designation or breakthrough therapy designation, the latter of which we actually have right now in both AML as well as in myelodysplastic syndrome. And this just helps for a more efficient engagement with regulatory agencies so we can try and move quicker whenever we think we have promising agents um, to help patients. Now, when you look at clinical trials, and I think especially over the last years, maybe decades, the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States is changing requirements. Some of the requirements include asking for more real-world data, asking data that includes women and children, and more diversity. How is Servier responding to this? And how does it impact clinical trial design? Yeah, th those are great questions. So I'm going to sort of break those apart a little bit. Uh, so starting with, you know, FDA's sentiment around being more inclusive and or supplementing trial data with real world evidence. Um, so absolutely agree. I think that, you know, historically, unfortunately, cancer drug development and the way in which we've had to conduct large randomized studies often requires working with large academic tertiary medical centers, which exist in, you know, major cities around the world. What that means is that a variety of patients may not have access to those centers because A, the transit time into the city, B, they may have a job that really prevents them from taking time off work, or they may have responsibilities at home when it comes to child rearing. This can pose significant challenges for patients to have access to clinical trials. Um, interestingly, I think because of this recent pandemic, we've learned that we can perform clinical research in remote capacities such that there's now an openness um, and an interest on the part of not only drug developers, but potentially even FDA to consider studies that would enable remote um, participation where reasonable, you know, so obviously certain inpatient visits would be required, but maybe not all. And I think this could really open the door towards being more inclusive of a variety of different 
uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, and of course, of uh, gender as well. When it comes to the pediatric requirement for drug development, yes, so within the FDA, there is a requirement that if you have a compelling drug that has shown efficacy in adults, that you provide a pediatric plan to at least say whether or not you think, you know, there's a population within the pediatric community that could also benefit from your drug. And so in the case of, you know, where we are with our drug development, where we have specific molecular aberrations for which we can screen patients like the IDH mutation, we are able to determine whether or not there's a segregation by age. Um, and if there is a, you know, pediatric population that we think could um, benefit from our drugs, then we absolutely would like to explore that. Um, and that's where we can either do it through a company-sponsored effort or potentially partner with a cooperative group that is um, capable of running pediatric trials. When it comes to um, what you were saying earlier about real-world evidence, it's, it's a bit challenging because I do think real-world evidence can be very important and informative because the trial population can be very narrow based on eligibility criteria to answer a specific scientific question. But when that drug now goes into the real world, it may perform differently. Um, we have yet to actually leverage real-world data to supplement any of our FDA filings, but it is an area within survey that um, we are actively exploring across all of our oncology assets. Um, we, in fact, have a dedicated real-world evidence group, um, and their, their exact you know, purpose is to help us understand, you know, are we asking the right questions within our study? And if we don't have the ability to get answers to every question, then why not generate a real world data set perhaps um, within a specific population to really understand um, if the benefit can extend beyond what we're able to show on the study. So I think a lot of the real world data sets can be supplementary. I've yet to see them be used as a standalone data set for approval. Um, so I think we have a ways to go to really understand the components of the real world data that, that would meet the standard for FDA. Um, but it is certainly something FDA has spoken about, and there is a door and an opportunity there to uh, partner with them on those topics. Now, talking about real world data, it is something that has been discussed for quite some time. ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, has developed a program, I think it's called ASCO's Cancer Link, that really links data from clinical trials to that from academic centers to regional and locally based doctors and physicians. How does this help in getting more data that maybe help you in fine tuning clinical research? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic question. So Ask the Link is one example. Um, AACR also has um, a very similar type of database that incorporates genomic analysis for patients as well, and, and that's called um, Project Genie. And then there are a variety of other commercial vendors that also do similar work. Uh, Flatiron, for instance, is one example. I think what's challenging here is that you really have to make sure that these databases are set up in such a way to collect the data that's most important, right? And so if you can pre-specify what are the data you know, variables that are going to help address a specific question, and then you can add some layers of quality checks to those data and make sure that they are verifiable at the, at the source, for instance, where they're being collected, um, then I think it can really be useful. But oftentimes these databases can just be a huge repository. And, and if the data aren't being collected specifically in a way so that you could then mine it and program it to address specific analyses, it can be very challenging. So it really depends on how the data are structured. And I think that's where it's important for, you know, ASCO or any of these other academically affiliated types of entities to really partner with industry and understand what are some of the requirements that regulators would need, for instance, in order to create a data set that's interpretable. Um, because the data that we collect in academics might be very different than what, you know, the standards are for FDA. So I think it, it just requires, I think, a multi-pronged approach where you can have the regulators present, the, uh, you know, folks on the industry side present, obviously academicians, and potentially even patient advocates present. Because I think one thing that's lacking in clinical research is really the patient's voice. It's, I think it's very important for us to understand what is most meaningful to a patient and are we able to capture that based on the research that we're doing. And so one part of that is through health-related quality of life 
questionnaires, but there may be other data metrics that we could be collecting that would be useful. Um, you know, days in the hospital, transfusion requirements, um, pain scores, um, the use of narcotics, you know, the need for supplements and nutritional support. You know, all of these things together can have a profound impact on a patient's quality of life. And I think um, there's more work to be done on that front. If you're just joining us, in this episode of the Oncosim Brief, I'm talking with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. We're talking about how Servier has made oncology one of its foremost priorities and endeavors to become a major player in treatments for cancers that are difficult to treat and for which therapeutic needs are generally not yet met, such as gastrointestinal, hematologic, pancreatic, and pediatric cancers. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. In the 1960s, a coalition of concerned citizens, scientists, and politicians joined forces to convince the federal government to focus its efforts on conquering cancer. In 1971, a single piece of legislation forever changed how we view cancer and cancer treatment. In that year, on December 23, 1971, the National Cancer Act was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. The National War on Cancer was declared, with some leaders naively arguing that the disease would be conquered by the nation's bicentennial, a mere five years in the future. The National Cancer Act cemented the nation's commitment to medical science, clinical trials, and advanced research, and over the next five decades, scientific discoveries demonstrated the great complexity of what had formerly been thought of as a single disease. With the advent of the genetic characterization of cancer, it is now recognized that there are almost an infinite number of cancers as defined by their many genetic mutations. The National Cancer Act established the infrastructure for the designation of centers of excellence by the National Cancer Institute, and these centers have evolved into models of multidisciplinary, collaborative cancer research, treatment, and prevention, contributing to a reduction in cancer mortality and increase in the quality of life and survival that has translated into more than 17 million cancer survivors in the United States since 2021. Join the Oncazine Brief this spring as we share the stories, the people, past and present, who have made progress possible and have shaped how cancer research, clinical trials, and treatment are being conducted today. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. In today's episode of the Oncosim Brief, I'm talking with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. In this episode of the Oncosim Brief, we talk about how Servier has made oncology one of its foremost priorities and how the company endeavors to become a major player in treatments for cancers that are difficult to treat and for which therapeutic needs are generally not yet met. I'm Peter Hofland. And this is the Youngest in Brief. And is it also the focus of Servier not just to look at the drug it is developing and how this may potentially cure a patient, but also at things how to improve health-related quality of life of patients? Is that part of the strategy of the company to really include all those different aspects? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would say it's not an afterthought. It's actually a focal point. Um, we have a separate patient advocacy group within Servier and, you know, their role is, is absolutely that, to engage with patient advocates around the world, not simply within the U.S., and, and really understand the patient's story. We have patients who come to survey and tell us their story, right, and, and meet with us firsthand and really give us a glimpse into what a day in the life looks like. Um, another aspect of how we involve patient advocacy is to actually look at our clinical protocols before we finalize them. The idea being here, you know, is this schedule of assessments that we're asking a patient to come in and do, does this actually make sense or are you seeing something in here that would stand out as being, you know, a deal breaker? Are we, are we collecting, you know, the right types of questionnaires for patients that are asking the right questions? So it is important to get patient input early. And I like the fact that, you know, survey takes a very proactive approach and engage in patient advocacy organizations and really helping them partner with us so that we can do this as a unified group, really. 
So it is really with the patient in mind that you're developing new therapeutic agents. Now let me ask you, is it true that with so much data and so much variety of data that it is difficult to analyze all this material? And what role, for example, does artificial intelligence or extensive data mining in better analyzing the data that is generated in conducting clinical trials actually play? Yeah, so we haven't explored AI yet. I will say that it's certainly top of mind for a variety of people within the company. For our clinical studies, we actually design the database ourselves. So for us, it's it's a non-issue, right? The way that we design our studies, we have an accompanying database that we already have designed to basically be a mirror image of what the study protocol is. We then have programmers and statisticians within our team who also proactively understand what the code looks like for programming the various data sets and their standardizations that FDA requires of the data in order for them to be submission worthy. So we do have a blueprint, if you will, that we follow in drug development. But I think what you're getting at is the exploratory data to really uncover something new, right, that we may not have predicted. And that's where our bioinformatics team comes in place, because you can imagine a lot of the genomic and translational data sets we collect, which involve next generation sequencing, single cell sequencing panels, and many of these are longitudinal samples, meaning they're not just collected at one time point, they could be collected throughout the patient's journey on the trial. Um, We're talking about hundreds of thousands of genetic readouts per patient. Um, So that absolutely qualifies as big data and requires a dedicated bioinformatics team to look for signal detection and patterns. And so they have softwares that help them uncover patterns. And then we have to look at it closely from, you know, a tumor biology standpoint and a clinical standpoint to understand do any of these patterns correlate with a specific outcome? Um, In this case, response, progression, or survival. AI, I think, is coming. Um, We haven't applied it directly in any of our data sets, but there are a variety of vendors that that are using AI specifically for not only genomic readouts, but also for imaging technology, which I find particularly fascinating, and then also for pathology, um, which is also particularly interesting. So I think it's, it's coming. We're seeing the tip of the iceberg, and I think you'll start to see more of it being utilized in clinical research as well. And that is all part of the future, a future that is definitely very exciting. Now, when you look a bit closer at home, at your future in the development of novel therapeutic oncology treatment options, where is the company going? Yeah, so I, well, I mentioned earlier that we have, yeah, we have our four products. We have also a fifth very interesting product for a side nib, um, which is a dual mutant IDH inhibitor. So it targets both IDH1 as well as IDH2. Um, this drug is not been approved yet. Um, However, it is in phase three development for patients with low-grade gliomas, which is a devastating primary brain tumor that occurs in adolescents and young adults. So this this drug has the potential to be the first targeted therapy uh, for patients with low-grade glioma. So we're very excited to be on the cutting edge of this frontier, and we're looking forward to that study completing enrollment hopefully next year. Um, with a readout in the 2024-2025 timeframe. So I would say that that's a, that's a really big, exciting program um, that's currently underway. We also have a variety of very exciting assets in the early phase portfolio that I mentioned. So they haven't quite migrated into late stage development, but they're certainly very promising. And some of these uh, targets are, you know, targeting very critical pathways and cell Uh, cycle regulation, as well as um, cell death in particular. So we have programmed cell death. That's normal part of, you know, the way a cell um, sort of lives out its its days, if you will. And the way that cancer evolves is that, you know, the cells become immortal because they hijack some of these uh, proteins that are otherwise there to create stop signals. So one of those important proteins is known as BCL2. Um, We have a BCL2 inhibitor that's being developed. Um, We have other targeted approaches for immuno-oncology, um, which I think are also very exciting. As you know, immuno-oncology has been a huge revolutionary um, development in cancer therapy over the past two decades. So we're excited to be in that um, space as well. So I think the future is bright. You know, we're targeting metabolic oncology, we're targeting cell death, and we're targeting immuno-oncology. And those are really three very critical pillars for drug development and, and cancer therapy. So I'm excited to be a part of that, and I'm very excited to see our programs moving quickly. Okay, well, 
On that very positive note, Dr. Suzanne Pandia, Vice President, Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. In this episode of the Oncus in Brief, I spoke with Susan Pandia. Dr. Pandia is Vice President, Clinical Development and Global Head of Cancer Metabolism at Servier Pharmaceuticals. For more information about Servier Pharmaceuticals, please go to servier.us. For us here at the Oncus in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes and Spotify. For more information about sponsoring or supporting the Ongazine Brief, go to ongazine at ongazine.com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is a global medical educational service from the publishers of Oncazine and ADC Review, the journal of antibody drug conjugates. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from our commercial underwriters and advertisers and the listeners to this station. For more information about advertising, underwriting, and sponsoring options, visit Oncazine at www.oncazine.com forward slash podcasts. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine-related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content in this program is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice and guidance. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.